welcome to Joint Lock Theory. Okay, so I've taught a class called uh, Choke Theory or Strangle Theory before, which I talked all about the different ways you can attack the arteries, um, neck, etc., lungs. Um, this one's going to be all about joints. I'm not going to explain every submission I'll get to, but ideally I give you a framework with which you can self heal your jiu -jitsu. So if you're having a problem with a wrist lock, arm bar, heel hook, toe hold, etc., hopefully I can help you troubleshoot it. I'm not going to make any guarantees, but because there's a general pattern that all of our joint locks follow, and whether they be um, straight or bent, there's a general pattern, and then there's specific things that will change, right? When you're doing a wrist lock, it's not exactly the same as doing an arm bar. When you're doing a heel lock, it's not exactly the same as doing an Americana. But there's general things that are true, and as you more deeply understand these truths, your technique will express them. So that's really my view of all jiu-jitsu, is that there's a series of, I call them jiu-jitsu truths. Uh, my friend Chris Prince calls them grappling laws. They're just things that are true. It's not a debate, it just is. And from those truths flow forth our technique. An arm bar is an, it's an expression of certain facets of jiu-jitsu. So it's a sweep, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna pose the statement that every joint lock in jiu-jitsu follows this rule. And the rule is this kind of argument I'm going to use, uh, I'll use the arm bar first. Is that enough? Lay on your back. Beautiful. All right. So, in the case of an arm bar, the joint which I'm attacking is your elbow. So, if I want to attack an elbow, I should control something above her elbow. And by above, I mean more proximal. Proximal means towards the core, distal means away from, right? So I used to say the joint closer, but there's exceptions where it's not that. It's something closer. I might control her bicep, her shoulder, her far shoulder, or her neck. It's something closer this way. It needs to be controlled. How do we usually do that? We do that with our leg over, or maybe we'll do it like this, or maybe we'll do it like that. The exact configuration of which arm bar I'm doing changes how I'm controlling it but I'm gonna need to control it. Right now, everything I've done so far are examples of direct control. Direct control means I'm touching the thing I'm controlling, right? I wanna control her neck and shoulders, my feet are touching her neck and shoulders. So that's step one, controlling something closer to the thing that I'm breaking, or the right way. Next thing is I need to attach to something distal. In the case of an arm bar, maybe you're gonna hold the hand or Maybe your coach has you doing a naked choke grip. Maybe you're doing the shotgun. Like all of these, but in all cases, I'm attaching myself to something on the other side. So that's step two. Every just put every submission. The last thing is I need a power system. I need something that is going to break the thing in the middle. And you can do it inefficiently with weak muscles. So what I mean by that is if I lay down and I do it inefficiently, I am Following the rules of arm bars, right? I'm, I'm attached to her shoulders and head. I have my hand attached to her hand, and I have something to break it over, and I just pull with my arms. This is inefficient because my arms are weak relative to, because right now Natasha's smaller than me. Two of my arms versus one of her arms is decent odds. But if we replace Natasha with someone who's 300 pounds and spends all day doing curls, they will literally just curl my body. I've had it happen to me, rolling with a heavyweight. I'm like this, and they curl, and I'm like, well, this isn't, this isn't very fun. But if I replace my weak arms, and even if you're strong, your arms are weak. They're weak relative to your legs, right? Um, with my back and these, these larger muscles, and I attach my whole body to this arm, whether I'm doing it like so or like so, now the muscles that are breaking her are big muscles. It's my whole trunk this is much stronger, much harder for her to curl me now, right? So those are the three pieces of every submission. So what I'd like you guys to all do is, I'm not, I'm just, I just showed you an armbar, right? I want you to go through and choose any submission, any submission that you like, and I want you to talk with your partner, have a conversation with them about those three pieces. This is a thinking class. Like I said, your brain hopefully hurts just a little bit, right? So, and see if you can do it. Right? Because most of the time, what are we doing? Coach says step one, step two, step three, step four. Ah, I must have messed up somewhere. I'm not doing any of that for you. You're going to have to do this yourself. Find a submission, any submission, 
find those three pieces and think about it. And then we'll come back, have a little chat, and continue. We're going to clap on beat because I believe in rhythm. All right? Ready? One, two. That was beautiful. Great job, guys. I'm not going to go over every single type of submission. I'm just going to go over two broad types because there's, there's other ones that are slightly different. So there's, there are compressions, like if you think of slicers and wrist locks and stuff. I only have an hour. I'm going to leave those out for the day. Um, they still follow those particular rules, so they kind of are going to In the case of like just a basic wrist lock, do, 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 do. I'm not doing this, is not a purpose, but just a turn, 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 turn. Just in theory, right? If I put Natasha elbow on the floor, I am not controlling it, but the floor is. I'm trying to break her wrist. The wrist is down the middle, right? So something below is the elbow. If I can immobilize her elbow, I'm not touching the elbow, but the floor is. The floor is my help. The floor is immobilizing her elbow. If I attach something below her wrist, which is her three fingers, this is not a good wrist look. I'm not stopping any escapes, but just in theory, if I keep pushing, her wrist goes, right? Why? Because I took her wrist past its range of motion, which is another truth for all of our joint locks. The body goes a certain amount, we're gonna push it past that. All right? Now, that's usually the case in the case of things that are straight joint locks, right? The elbow bends one way, we bend it the other way, right? In the, uh, but in the case of all of these straight ones, there's another important variable, right? The elbow, when I was doing the arm for the first time, just think of the armbar as our first example. Right? Whether I, I'm not going to the armbar across the feet. Like, all these details, don't worry about it. We're thinking general. Those details are what we get into later. Right now, we're looking at the high level view of things so that we can self heal. There's a reason why people choose sometimes to say crossing the ankles is the devil, or why you choose one over the other. There's a reason for all of this. But we don't have time for that today. I guess it's just as simple as that, isn't that time? So like, there's a reason for this, but in general, you want the most efficient way of controlling this thing, which is proximal to what we're trying to break. I saw a couple people get this situation where they got here and their partner was trying to go, and they did this. And Tosh just started messing with your wrist. And so they're like, I can't get it, right? What's well, because the angle that you get is necessary. So I need her elbow to be in the direction that I'm applying force to it. If she spins her hand around like this or like this, suddenly her elbow is pointing the wrong way. I'm putting force into here and I'm having a harder time breaking it, it's just gonna bend. Another thing that isn't talked about a lot is there must be room for the thing to break. So on the case of this arm bar, it's really easy to see. There's the sky, there's nothing stopping the wrist from breaking right here. I attach to it however I want. Don't worry about my wrist being perfect. I attach to it, I lean back, and it can break. There's nothing in the way. But it's a trap one. A lot of times you see the exact same arm lock, the razor lock, done in guard. I see a lot of people having a problem where they'll put the hand on their chest like this, and then they'll sit here and they're like, it won't break. Well, that's because there's no space for it to break. You're saving them. But instead of contracting my body and bridging into it, if I begin to contract my body, sorry, extend my body, I contract my body, I made space. There's a space for the arm to break. I'm doing the same thing, right? I'm attaching to the wrist. I'm not attached to the shoulder, but guess what it is? The rest of her body which acts like a weight, holding it in place. So I have indirect control, which is kind of the complicated part sometimes. Indirect control is harder to understand. Direct control is easy. Control it. Touch it. Control it. Check. But indirect is not always easy to tell. I'm holding it right here. I hold the elbow and I can sit up. And I'm causing damage. But none of that would have worked if I stayed extended. I'm just giving her arm a hug and it's like an awkward massage. It's not helpful. So, what am I trying to show you guys? The rotation of the person's arm, or sometimes the looks right? You see the toe slipping, their leg, needs to be accounted for. So we have those, those first three steps we did before, and now we're thinking of angle. I'm going to give you one more, because what's another way the arm button escapes? Is our depth. Even though, right now, I'm controlling something above, right? If I get lazy, and I'm controlling something above, I get lazy, I do an armbar like this, I don't get the armbar, even, with, even without her defending. 
if you've seen any like of the kind of fake self fake self defense people online teaching jiu jitsu, like guys, this is the best armbar ever. Like, ah, and their students tapping and flying around, right? So it looks silly to us. And please don't like cut this tip out. Charles teaches armbar, so this is horrible. But I'm teaching you what not to do. But it's because I didn't account for depth. So I must account for depth by, instead of simply extending my fingers, I'm curling in. The closer my hips are to here, the more that I can keep her elbow from leaving. So we have angle and depth. So that's our second layer. Our first thing was our kind of three, our, our three point list. Now we're accounting for things that can go wrong. If I curl everything in and contract it, it makes it harder for me to lose the depth. If I take, instead of a rear naked choke grip, if I grab her palm right here, like we're about to do like the Arnold Schwarzenegger, you son of a bitch, right? You know? Let's see, someone knows. Someone's not trying to. Right, so we're here. Hold it up. Now she can't spin her hand as well. So this allows me to take care of two problems at the same time. But if I get too focused on this problem and I relax my legs, Natasha can take her arm out. And if I get too focused on curling and I don't relax my hand, Natasha can spin her hand. Right? Because if you look, what's what were the most common escapes in Jiu-Jitsu? Connect the technical. People hit like all the time. So, what I want you to do now is to introduce wrinkles. You're welcome, to, if you're kind of sticking on the straight and narrow, you can introduce wrinkles with this, the, um, the arm bar, or you can do other things. But I want you to just introduce a little wrinkle to your partner and see if they can overcome it. You're not supposed to win. Like, Natasha is not supposed to win. I'm supposed to win. She's supposed to make me fail just a little bit and then coach me through it. So, if I'm over here just, just blindly failing, Natasha just turns her thumb down and I'm just, I'm just like, just sitting here just... So I was like, hey Charles, you're doing it wrong, and she'll help me. We're not adversaries, we're partners, we're friends, we're trying to help each other. But anytime that I'm being lazy, if she feels this laziness, she's gonna take her elbow out, because I'm not stopping it. If she feels that I'm not controlling the rotation, she's gonna rotate it. But I should be able to do all of this at a super slow speed, super relaxed. And you can go through any of your submissions with a partner and kind of check on them but you have to turn off the adrenaline. You have to turn off the ego. If you can't do it slow and controlled with someone who's not resisting, you can't do it against someone who is resisting. So if I have to acquire every ounce of my physicality to defeat someone who's not trying, then when they try, I'm screwed. So we're gonna try it again. This is, this is also true. Um, I'm gonna borrow your leg for a second. Because they were using the knee bar as their example. All right, so a knee bar is a lot like an arm bar. <coughs> so I'm over here, and the same thing would work here. If I completely ignore his leg, if I'm just doing this, well, now he has the same idea of rotation. He can rotate his foot away, and I just lost my knee bar. Now I'm doing the Or he can rotate his foot the other way. Same problems, right? Exact same problems. It's a straight leg that can rotate. Well, then now if I got really good at stopping rotation, but I got lazy about my legs, he can step on my knee and take care of that. It's the exact same stuff. So how can I solve that here? Well, if I take my ankles and I back heel, that takes care of depth. And if I make his foot into a pillow, and he can show, it takes care of rotation one direction. He can still rotate one way, but I hope that, yeah, he can still rotate that way. So fun fact about legs, if I want to stop him from going away from me, I want to put my head on top of the foot. If I want to stop it from going into me, I put my head on the bottom of the foot. Because right now, if he tries to turn into me like he did, his foot's going to break. But he can roll away. So I have to kind of, based upon how he's defending, put his foot on either side of my face. And the same thing, if I don't want to lose it, back heels are your friend. Everyone loves triangles, but triangles, in my opinion, usually aren't as good as you think, unless you have something large between your legs, it sounds funny, unless you have something large that you're squeezing with your legs, or you, uh, oh, that, that was mildly distracting. Right. <laughs> or you have very short legs, all right? If you have very short legs, then you can try and let everything. My legs aren't super long, but I find that triangles usually are the best way. I find that I have a much more look, much more luck with leg curves.
But like I said, stick with whatever submission you've been practicing or do a different one, it's fine. But I want you to think conceptually. So what are we doing again? So like I've talked a lot, your partner's gonna mess with either depth, if you're being lazy, remove depth for me, stop my foot. Boop. Or they're gonna mess with rotation. Go ahead, turn. And so you should be able to solve those two problems, all right? Get with your partners. One, two. Hello. So, um, we're gonna do a quick, we're gonna come back to the arm bar again later. But now we're gonna do a quick divergence into bent locks. So, that would be your Americana, Kimura, inside heel look, outside heel look, etc. <coughs> I say those versus the toe hold, because a lot of times the toe hold will break the foot, which is not exactly this. But in general, what you want to know when you're doing a, an attack that attacks an entire leg or an entire arm, because for example, the Americana can break the elbow or the shoulder. The heel hook can break the ankle or the knee. Same with toe hold can break the foot or the knee. Why is this? It's whatever part has the most tension and the most weakness. If you've got a rubber wrist, then the wrist lock might actually, the middle might affect the elbow. If you've got a really flexible shoulder, same thing goes to the elbow, or a really flexible elbow goes to the shoulder. There's also angles you can change to kind of force it to be into one joint or the other. But in general, that's the reason. Um, the, wherever is pliable will give. But once there's tension, that's what breaks, which is why, right, if someone's heel looking me, I'm gonna pantomime that because it's easier to see, because if Natasha's heel looking me, you can see. If I sit still and flex everything, well, suddenly she can break my ankle. Well, if I let my ankle go, well, then now my knee's gonna break. If I let my knee go, well, now my whole body has to roll to take the uh, force away. I don't know if you guys ever watched any of those movies where they have the great CGI where you see someone like, some superhero twists like a plank of wood and you see the shockwave spiral through the wood and then it all explodes at the end. It's real exciting, right? Um, that's what you're doing whenever you attack a bent joint, a bent, uh, bent joint lock. Now here's the next bit that I think is really, really useful. I actually learned this from watching an instructional from Eddie Cummings. Like, Whenever he put out his low $50 instructional, it was, it was so useful. And I keep repeating it ever since. Can everybody see my leg? If you can't see my leg, move. Whenever I'm trying to heel up somebody, I'm trying to align their foot and their hip in one way or the other, whether it be like this or like that. I'm making a triangle. Just the base of the triangle is invisible. Right? I want to force this alignment, and then if I'm doing an inside heel look, I want to keep their knee outside of this line that I made. And then I attack it, and things go pop. Or they attack. Standing on the other side. So, if I'm in an outside heel look, and I remove that alignment, outside heel look to me becomes very, very challenging, if not impossible. In fact, the straighter my leg, the harder. Don't be wrong, you can still be damaged by a heel look when your leg is straight. It's just, things get different. It's not as easy, it's less efficient for them. But bad things can still happen. Someone can still break the lower part of your leg. There's things can still that go very, very wrong, but it's hard. Same thing if I'm at an outside heel look like this, and they're trying to attack me. If I manage to flip my leg over and do this, once again, the pressure goes away. If we're thinking again, it's like an Americana. What did your coach always tell you? Your coach probably told you to paint the floor, right? And now your arm is in a vulnerable position. And pop. On a kimura, same thing. Down here isn't really that good of a kimura. They draw it up, make the shoulder less mobile. So it's not just making you strong, it's making them weak. The weaker your opponent is, the less force you need to break them. And then you add the fact that you're using a large power system. Life becomes easier. Kind of argument session. So we're gonna for right now, I'm gonna actually demonstrate this with the heel hook. If you're like, heel hook's so scary, I don't wanna do it, you don't have to. You can do it with the armor. So I'm gonna show both, but um, it's the same concept. So we're gonna shift gears for a second about not losing submissions. Because all of our breaking power usually comes from coming into a state of extension when we're using our hips. Not always, I showed you the example of the razor lock where we're crunching. But usually when we're breaking a joint, we're breaking the joint by extending our body. And usually when we're strangling someone, we're doing it by contracting our body. Always there will be exceptions, but this is a general rule. However, if I have a savvy partner who's trying to escape, right? 
and I'm still trying to break them while they're trying to escape, they're probably going to escape. So I have to know partners trying to escape, I want to be in a contracted state. If I am in a contracted state, whether you, like I said, we're not teaching details right now. So if you want to play this with feet crossed, with feet together, I like doing my feet behind, it's all up to you. These details, we don't have time for today. But what I care about, if my partner is trying to escape, especially escape by rolling, rolling away in particular for the case that we're going over right now, I want to be in a contracted state. If I have an extended state, let's, I have a helix on Natasha, my body, Natasha is simply going to start trying to roll that way. If I stay extended, she's going to be able to extract her leg very easily. And I lose her. In particular, it's not really even my chest. What it's really about is my butt. If my butt and my hips are over here, far from my feet, I'm not very good at keeping things close to me. My body is good at breaking things with that force. However, if instead, and the grip we're going to use for this, we're not going to worry about breaking mechanics. We're just going to say, I was trying to break. I sense Natasha is trying to escape. Forget my heel. I'm just going to grab my hamstring. Right, right around here. Um, if you prefer to grab your butt, you can. I prefer grabbing my hamstring. I've tried both, just for whatever reason. The, the butt has my hand further back, and this is just more, more uh, space for her to leave. I like to grab my hamstring. Now the people who got here early, or just did not desire water, because water is weakness, it's not kind of a hard thing, um, they did this roll. I'm gonna use this arm to protect my face. If I put the side of my cheek on the mat, even though I'm contracted, I'm gonna hit a wall. Tasha, keep rolling. This feels bad, I'm gonna naturally extend, save my face. So don't put your cheeks on the mat. It's gonna be painful and unnecessary. Grab your hamstring. I'm gonna try to put my forehead on the floor. Or even if I don't put my forehead, I'm gonna put like, you know, like a uh, Cobra Kai's on my mat. You've seen like, what they're doing. Like, I'm blocking karate, right? Protect your face. As I'm rolling, I put my forearm on the floor and I drive my butt into Natasha. You see how I can kind of stop her? I'm driving my butt towards my foot and keeping her bent. The more that I keep her bent, the harder it's gonna be for her to run away. She can try and pull her foot out right now, but it's bent. It's stuck in there. If you look at the angle of her foot, as I extend, it becomes easier for her to take it out. Come back in. But when I'm bending, I can keep her, and I can keep our relative position, so that if she rolls, I can stay together with her, over my floor, and we're in the exact same place that we started. So because of this, watch your space, because you're going to roll into somebody else. If you've ever been in an armbar escape situation, this should look very, very familiar. I'm going to do it one more time with the heel look, and I'm going to show you the, the analogy, the analogous situation on armbars, in case you're not in defeat. Once again, great. So, right here, I'm going to grab right here, turn this over, I want to make sure you go I'm choosing to use my, my foot back here. That's just my preference because I don't like being counterfoot locked. Honey stick is very popular these days and it doesn't feel good. I know this because at least one of you have tried to honey stick me at camp this week. It wasn't fun for me. So, but like I said, it still works if you don't. Grabbing your hamstring, forearm, coming over, coming right here, coming through. There's all kinds of fancy stuff that I can show you from here, but that's not this class. I want you to simply not lose the leg. That's all I want from you. Don't lose the leg. Into arm bars. Uh, go ahead and just we'll make it easy. Uh, turtle pin. So you can do the arm bar entry however you want. Because I'm gonna roll. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. I'm trying to help you out. So do a bad turtle. <laughs> I don't want to have to break through this right now. This is the starting position. I'll tell you why in a moment. Cool. So, I'm doing an arm bar configuration that involves a scissoring motion. So, here's my, Natasha has my chin on the back of her head, um, and I have my hand just by the head, hooking. Even if she grabs her hand, grabs her hand or something, and is defending, I'm okay with that. This is the starting position. I can show you ways of getting there, but that's once I get more time. Why am I doing this way? Because in this same scenario, I'm trying to arm bar Natasha. She's not really cooperating. If I extend my body, she will roll out and escape. Roll out and escape. I'll take her arm out and life's back for me. 
<laughs> However, once again, judo people probably since the right shoulder leg in terms of here. If instead I keep the head on the floor, because you have the forearm on my hand, and I roll, I end up right here in the same position. Rotate, or pass. And the cool thing I love about this one is that you can repeat it over and over again. So now if Natasha decides that she wants to sit up, I'm going to have this forearm ready, and I do it again. <laughs> okay. Cool. And I want to make her roll over her head. That wasn't exactly the roll that I wanted to, I'm going to try it again. She sits up. I press my shin into her head, and I make her do a front kick, like so. Are you can roll the other shoulder? I don't want to break your neck. I can let me break your neck. Okay. So you see how I like surfed over her face? That's really me. I don't want to use that to do that. <laughs> so I want to kick the back of the head. I'm going to give you another analogy for it. Do me a favor on these. You can hit this arm bar the exact same way if you're playing a guard game. Natasha stacks me. I'll stick my arm through the far leg, switch my shin, and spin underneath. And this is how it has real contacts. And I'm going to push on her head, pull on her foot, and I make her do that somersault. In the turtle situation, if your partner extends, then it's very, very painful for them. And I don't like causing my training partner's pain, unless like this is a competition or a money situation, which this is. Tasha's not going to give me money if I armbar her. In the that works. So try either of them, but like I said, the same concept is this. Simply rolling laterally, which is why I had you guys do the beginning class. If you're confused, when you're in the turtle position, drive your butt backwards. If your butt is forward, you are extending. If your butt is backwards, you are contracting. All right, do one more heel up because that would spend a lot of time on the arm bar, then we'll call it. If you go for an engine heel up, simply put one foot across like an knee slice, take your foot over and have a seat like so. Grab your own hamstring, your partner starts to roll away, catch the floor, and just keep rolling. All right? That's it. Good luck. Have fun. One, two. Entry, so I'm borrowing Tasha. For those of you who don't know how to enter the leg, entry was the Entry was stepping across. Don't kick your partner, that's me. Um, stick your leg over here, like you're like meeting the queen, do a curtsy. Right. Take your knee through, and here's your entry. You leave by technical stand up, you can practice that a few times. When you're coming through, like I said before, lean forward, crunch, 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 grab the hamstring. And that's what I, I need from you guys. When you roll, protect yourself. We'll do it real fast. Natasha starts to roll away. I follow her. My feet should stay on the same side. You guys might be finding your feet are switching, which is okay if you did it on purpose. If you didn't do it on purpose, it's not okay. If you're like, oops, then yeah, you messed up because they're going to heal up you. And that's not fun. But if you did it on purpose, you might heal up them. The general just a, for the armbar. Let's go over it again. Um, for context, the main way this happens for me when I'm rolling is either if I hunt for it or if they stack. Me. If I'm hunting for it, let's turn this way. Yeah. If I'm hunting for it, the way that happens is a regular armbar happens by attacking the arms across and being close. See so guys close. But shin on the head, the armbar happens by being open. So instead of turning my head this way, I'm going to reach over with this arm, and just kind of either hold it like this, or we're going to make a choke it, and I'm going to open. So I'm going to throw my body open this way. So I'm right here, and I open. So I was over here, and I come up to my elbow, and I'm going to bring my shin to the back of her head like so. So it's a lot of this, pulling it this way. So maybe I was going for an arm, but I changed my mind. I Use that momentum to swing up. My body goes up here, just kidding, I'm coming this way. My shin comes over, I clamp my knees together, but most importantly, like last time, if I'm over here, it's gonna fail. Drive my butt backwards. This hand that was here, if it comes, a hug, I can either choke the wrist or we're naked choke. Now, all I'm gonna do while keeping my butt backwards is just fall my butt to the side. Poop. If she doesn't roll, it's okay. I can hang out here and try and dig her arm out arm bar right here. If she has her hands together, then I'll reach my hand over and knock out her leg, but try my best to grab her foot and pull it over and make her roll. In this moment, I don't want to chase her. Because if you do it really fast, your partner will be trying to sit up. I stay here and wait. If she sits still, loop, I switch to right here to finish the armbar if I want. If she chooses to try and sit up, 
then I can roll through. I ended up in this kind of half triangle position. I'll often uh, end up with my foot underneath as well. Either variant can still work. I have to just make sure that I sit up on that same roll. You see how I'm coming to my forehead again? Shin on the back of the head, leg right here, and I fall to my hip again. And you land in the face of the camera. This is my favorite thing to do when I was brown belt. I was at my gym. There was a black belt who was better than me. I could never beat him. But I figured out I could put him in this infinite loop of me almost arm barring him for like a minute. He didn't like that very much. And that was my little victory. Remember I told you in my last class how you changed the rules? So my victory was how many rolls can I make this black belt team? And if I could get 10 rolls, I won the match. I don't care if he's tapped out or not, that was my win. And I got really good at this armbar simply by failing to armbar somebody over and over and over. That's the armbar details. Try again, armbar or heel hook or both. I just felt they didn't do that enough, so I gave you some more details. Try again. Remember, contract. One, two. That was the main concept I wanted you guys to understand. I had one more thing I wanted to talk about, um, which is the idea of, it's that same idea I talked about before, right, of being proximal or distal. So, but I'm gonna talk about it in terms of keeping things still and, keep, and moving things, and then we'll be done. If you have any special questions for me, ideally you can use this kind of uh, metric I gave you to self-heal. Be like, my arm bar is not working, why? My Kimura is not working, why? But you can get into it. But um, if you want help, please ask me. I'm, I'm down to help during camp. But um, this idea of... Yeah, the concept that I wanted to talk about... I'm getting all of a sudden. Thank you. So, right here. Yes! So, sorry, my brain got a little, a little misty. Is keeping things when you're moving here. So anytime I'm trying to break something, I want to be tracking down. So it will move something around. There we go. I got my brain on. We can just edit that out, right? It have to happen. <laughs> so anytime you have situations where your partner is crossing their feet, or in general trying to keep something still, I want to move to the end of the lever. So in the case of leg locks, oftentimes I like sitting on people. Sorry, Natasha. And so her feet are crossed, whether they be ankle crossed or triangle for me, or triangles. There we go. I got thick legs, I'm sorry, yeah. If I grab, her leg here, I'm never gonna undo it. But if I grab her at her heel, or I do a taco grip, I can move things. It's actually a really cool little experiment you can do. Have your partner, no matter how strong they are, in whatever position you want, you can be here. I think actually 50 50 is the easiest because you can both practice with each other. And I can have Natasha squeeze as tight as she wants. If I get to her heels, they will split every time. She can cross them the other way, I don't care. Because this time I will be grabbing the bottom of this one and the top of this one if I want. Actually, I would do this one. So I always want to be pushing this one that way and this one that way. So I would reach in. Boop. I move things by being at the end of the lever. Touch on this end of the knee if she wants. Boom. Same thing works. It's going to the arm bar situation. How many times have you uh, turn, 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 turn? Have you had situations when you're in the arm bar? Where your partner's grabbing their hands together? Right? And how long have you been here going, and they're not going anywhere, right? Well, this is the middle of their arm. Breaking their grip by holding their bicep will probably only happen if they let go on purpose or you're just gargantually bigger than them, right? You're, you're 280 and they're 110. Yay, I need a jiu-jitsu for this. <laughs> <laughs> I can just get bigger than all my people, just keep eating, and then I win a jiu-jitsu. No. If I move to her hand, Right? The hand is always weaker. A lot of times we're grabbing the wrist, which is pretty good, but the hand is easier. So once again, I like doing phone grips. I'll take my fingers, get on either side of their fingers, and collapse them. And they move. Right? And the lever moves things. On the other hand, bottom of the lever keeps things. A lot of times we're here, holding the arm, and Natasha takes her elbow. I lost it. How's that happen? All right, everyone can close to this one, because this one's hard to see. I have this grip I call in solid tongues. So imagine that you're at your mom's house, a fancy dinner, she made you a nice salad. You want to pick the salad up. If your mom doesn't eat salad, I'm sorry. All right? Take your hands together just like this. So you're going to pick up some lettuce, some tomatoes, whatever you eat for salad. If you don't eat salad, it's a meat salad and you can pick up some steak. All right? Take your hands in. You're going to grab the bulbous part of their shoulders. If I hold the joint above what I want, I will never lose the one that I want. I want her elbow. If I have her shoulder, if I don't lose her shoulder, I cannot lose her elbow. And so I salad on her shoulder. Try to take your elbow out. 
and I don't have to even be strong. She's never going to get that. Because as long as I have her shoulder, I can't lose her elbow. Going back to bed, it's the same idea. If I'm in here, and I'm holding her foot, there's a chance that she just tips me over and takes her knee out, right? I'm holding her foot, I could lose that when I'm holding her foot. I'll occasionally do things to stop that, but it's possible. However, if I don't want to lose her leg entirely, and I reach as low as I can by her butt, by her hamstring, I put my hand in my own pocket using my elbow, take her leg out. That's my leg now. Now occasionally, um, I'm going to borrow some really big real fast. You're the largest person I can see quickly. Just sit down and repeat that with me. You're going to probably make me, make me go flying. Let's find out how this happens. I can stay attached to him. But if he kicks his foot down really fast, I will still fly. I am still attached to him. It's still my leg. But he's still bigger than me. And I will still fly. So keep that in mind, this idea of being attached. So you always want to be low to stay attached, but if I know that, right, you can figure out someone's bigger than you. Like I look at him like, this is a larger human than me. I know this much. I don't know how much, but he's bigger than me. If I feel that he's about to kick, kick really hard, thanks. Fur pass. <laughs> so. <laughs> so get with your partner and play with this idea of moving things at the ends, keeping them at the core, and then we'll take a photo and call it a day. One, two. Workshop, any submission you have any problems with or any ideas, this is not all of my ideas on this topic. I try to keep it simple and I still ended up making it pretty complicated. Um, but the whole idea is just try to always take whatever specific goodness, because your professor has a specialty. Every black belt has a piece of jiu-jitsu they've obsessed over for years and years, and they're going to give you that magic in that area. That magic will usually follow general rules. If you can extrapolate the rules of jiu-jitsu from your professor's special sauce, you can bring their special sauce to other parts of your game. Maybe your professor isn't obsessed with it, right? So that's the idea. Um, thank you so much. We're going to take a photo now.